She stood in the corridor, silently looking at the suitcases, laptop, and his briefcase. They lay where she had not noticed them when she entered. She returned to the office and looked at the man sitting in the shadows. You're crazy, Lyle. You leave me and our two sons? Because of one quarrel. I made one stupid mistake when I was drunk a few hours ago. I didn't have sex with anyone. I didn't betray you. You're just out of your mind. When he didn't respond, she walked towards him, and he raised his hand again as if giving a stop sign. She stopped. She wondered if he really had a nervous breakdown. This man was not her husband, was not the man with whom she lived for eight years. No one could change so dramatically in a few hours. He had never been like this before, ever. And the worst part was that there was really nothing that could explain it. Nothing much happened at the party. She backed away, but did not sit down. Can you tell me why? Can't you at least do this? I had a moment of epiphany. She heard these words, but could not grasp any meaning in them. Moment of epiphany? Why are you doing this, Lyle? I know you think you're smarter than me, anyone in my family, anyone here. But why can't you help but rub our noses in the fact that we are idiots compared to you? Put it into words I can understand. The figure, shrouded in shadow, changed its position, tilted its head forward slightly and seemed to rest it on its closed fists. I'm very sorry, Diana. This is true. I do not want to do this. That's just what English literature professors think and say. It's actually not that hard to explain. We, all of us, walk around never really seeing what our whole life is all about. We are blinded by all the little details of our existence. Waking up, brushing our teeth, going to work, paying bills, watching what's on TV tonight, and the kids catching colds and wondering if we're getting fat or if our husbands or wives are looking at others. We never take a step back and get a picture of where our lives are, except in rare cases. He stopped, and she remained silent, hoping that he would continue. I had a moment of epiphany this evening. You repeat this all the time, but what does it mean? And what did you see? Even though she couldn't see his face clearly, she knew he had his laser-like gaze focused on her face. She felt the power of his gaze on her skin. I saw our life, Diana. I saw who we are, who we were, and who we have become. It had nothing, or very little, to do with what happened at the party. You're right, leaving because of one fight, one mistake, one incident would be crazy. That's not why I'm leaving. I'm leaving because I realized that our marriage was a mistake, that I love you but you don't love me, that I will never and probably never satisfy you sexually the way you should be satisfied, that deep down you a good woman and will never leave me because you will keep your promises and that we are too young to ruin each other's lives for the next 40 or 50 years. That's why I'll leave when we finish our conversation. About three hours earlier, I pulled into the driveway at 9.30 p.m., but my cell phone was silent. He had been silent since I left the Rivers Trailer Park south of Palatka at 8 p.m., left my wife and about 75 of her close and extended family and friends drinking and dancing at the monthly party that had been a tradition for almost the entire eight years of our marriage. We lived in Jacksonville, a city of one million in northeast Florida, about an hour and a half north of Palatka. The house was dark except for an automatic yard light with an electric eye sensor that illuminated the driveway as I walked, or rather limped, along it. It was a rowdy evening, and I felt much older than my chronological age of 34, more like 74. But all I had to do was sneak a six-pack of Michelob lights into the house, so that's what I did. I turned on the kitchen light and sat at the table where we ate most of our meals instead of the small dining nook where we were supposed to eat. I unscrewed the top of one Michelob, took a long sip of the deliciously cold drink and let it slide down my throat. Then another one. All this time I was waiting for the first dial tone from my mobile. Nothing. I looked at the pictures that five-year-old Billy drew in school with a magnetized pencil on the refrigerator door and at the photo of seven-year-old David catching his first pass at a Pop Warner PV football game. My throat tightened slightly, and I consciously fought not to burst into tears as I looked at David's dark young body, caught in the act of his first athletic triumph. He looked like his mother, with her dark hair and lithe figure. 
Both boys had their mother's dark hair instead of my sandy blonde, and both boys had their mother's light brown eyes instead of my ice blue. I had a hard time suppressing the lump in my throat. They and their mother were my world. Just a few hours ago, I came close to losing them all, and it was like standing on a train track in the dark of night, watching the train approach, frozen on the tracks. I took another sip and leaned my head against the dark-grained wood of the table for a moment. I finished the bottle and forced myself to get up from the table. Sooner or later, the phone will ring, and then eventually the front door will open, and I'll have to do something before that happens. I went up to the second floor, to the bedroom that Diana and I had shared for five years since we moved to this rather expensive Mandarin area. We moved there because the schools were pretty good. I taught an introductory English literature course at Jacksonville University, a small private liberal arts college on the other side of town, but I liked the Mandarin area better than the area around JU, so I put up with the hours-long commute every day. I opened the closet door and found two suitcases that Diana and I had used on our last cruise to the Bahamas two years ago. Then I started opening drawers and pulling out as much laundry as I could find. I pulled out a week's worth of trousers, shirts, and jackets. I had to remember to bring a razor, a toothbrush, toothpaste, a few medications, everything I would need for the trip away from home. I leaned over the chest of drawers and felt the urge to vomit. I overcame it. Only this trip will never end. It was an escape from everything I loved or had ever loved, and I never intended to return. If I let myself think about it too much, I know I'll freeze. So I very methodically put together everything I needed to start life again as a single man after eight years of marriage. I found my laptop and my briefcase with the work I would need for college. I moved it all into the hallway that led to the dining room to the left of the front door. No one will see this when they enter the house unless they actually enter the dining room. When I had collected everything I could think of, I took a six-pack of Michelob's with five bottles of beer and went into the office. The front door led into a hallway that led to the right and then into an office. I sat down in an easy chair at the far end of the office and placed Michelob on the glass coffee table in front of me. There was a floor lamp behind the chair and I turned it off. There was a light in the corridor that could be turned on by anyone who entered. I stood on a chair and dimmed the light bulb in the center of the office so that it would not light up when you pressed the switch at the entrance to the office. When everything was ready, I sat back in the soft chair in the darkness of what was my home, opened the second Michelob, and began to drink carefully in small sips. Around 11 p.m., my cell phone rang for the first time. The screen of the Nokia flip-top glowed in the dark, and I recognized Diana's mobile phone number. I didn't answer. About three minutes later, I heard a signal that a message was waiting for me. I didn't open it. Five minutes later, the phone rang again, and then, after another three minutes, and after another five, and after ten, and after another five. Diana called her father Richard, her older brother Dave, her younger sister Kelly, and then Diana again. If there was any humor left in the world, I would find the parade of telephone calls funny. But the funny thing had died a few hours ago, and I didn't think I'd find anything funny again for a long time, if at all. The home phone rang, then the cell phone, and then the home phone again. I just finished my second Michelob and started my third. Time crawled forward and, like a traitor, refused to run back so that the day that destroyed my life could relax and give me a second chance. But even as I voiced this normal human desire, deep down I knew that what happened lasted longer than one day, and I would have to turn back time at least eight years to undo the damage, and that would not happen. It was a cool November, but not too bad. The RV site and cabins near Lake Como south of the tent were usually nearly empty this time of year, so it was a good place for Richard Carter and his clan and friends to hold their monthly dances, meetings, parties, in a quiet place where no one would complain about the noise or call the police and people could relax. Carter and his wife, Ricky, raised a brood of nine boys and girls, eight of whom still survive, 
and when all the children gathered together with other family members, such as uncles, aunts, and friends, there was usually a crowd of a hundred or more adults. Richard and Ricky built a road and asphalt paving company that made them millionaires by the late 60s, and they enjoyed hosting monthly Saturday night parties. There was always southern rock and fried chicken and ribs and oysters in season and plenty of beer and spirits to suit every taste. Diana and I did not go there every month, but we tried to come as often as possible. Richard and Ricky did their best to welcome a Yankee stranger from the strange land of Massachusetts into their family, even though I knew they sometimes had difficulty understanding me and how I made a living. I didn't sell cars, fix cars, build houses, mortgage parking spaces, or make money like everyone else in their group did. I stood in front of bored young men and women and talked about poetry, novels, essays, and other nonsense that most of the Carter clan had little understanding of and even less interest in. Drinking usually began around noon. The cabins, as well as a few wagons, were available for anyone who needed them to sleep off too much drinking. Diana and I sent the boys to Freen's whose parents we trusted. They knew we could be back tonight or Sunday morning. We looked after their children when they needed it. There was an old concrete dance pavilion that was mainly used only when Carter's parties were held, and a loudspeaker was installed. We ate and drank a little while people came and started drinking. By five o'clock in the evening, it was getting dark. The music became louder and the drinking more intense. Diana was walking around talking to people, and I was standing at one of the tables, still laden with food, eating a few grapes. She shimmered like a ghost in the twilight in a floaty white dress that hugged her hips, highlighting her full bum and 36C breasts that looked even bigger. She had long hair flowing down the back, and I don't think I've ever seen a more beautiful woman. Sometimes I would just watch her for hours at these parties, because dancing and drinking are not my thing, just staring at her and marveling that an outsider could come along and steal her away from the hordes of horny Southern admirers who wanted that body and face in their beds. As usual, drinking, dancing, seductive women, and lustful men are not the most peaceful mixture. One of Kelly's sister's old beaus took her out dancing to a particularly wobbly tune and was able to dry fuck her in front of everyone until her husband Billy came out there and laid him out with a thunderous right cross. Cooler heads prevailed, the beer flowed freely, and within minutes the two men had shaken hands. The old gentleman had received a kiss from his old sweetheart, and Billy and Kelly had gone looking for a dark place to do the dirty deeds they usually do. Did it at every party. The pavilion began to fill with people, even Richard and Ricky moving to the beat of some southern rock, when I noticed that I had lost track of Diana. When I saw her, my stomach sank. She was slow dancing with a tall, dark-haired man in a cotton shirt and jeans. She melted into his arms, and I could see his large hands running up and down her back, almost down her ass, although I saw her pull his hands away when they got too low. Bobby Trescott was one of the guys who stalked her before I showed up at the insurance company where she worked to transfer my auto insurance to her company. For some reason, she liked a stranger with an even stranger accent, and six months later, we got married. Bobby never took this decision well. He still called and sometimes visited, and Diana insisted on seeing him as a friend, not an ex-boyfriend. At these parties, he always danced inappropriately close, touching places he shouldn't touch, and usually made some smart comments to and about me to the general amusement of many. I made my way through the twilight towards them both, watching them move together. I couldn't help but be jealous. Diana was drunk. Not enough to get drunk, but enough to relax and kind of melt in his arms. I got close enough and said loud enough for them to hear, Hey Bobby, do you mind if I chime in? Diana looked at me without a hint of guilt and smiled lazily. Hey baby, I just had a little dance with old Bobby. I promised him this dance. It's the dance from our prom. You don't mind if I finish with him, do you? Bobby smiled at me and, so I could see it, slipped his left hand under her blouse to cup her breast. Because it was dark, only the three of us could see what he was doing. Diana gave him a strange look and then looked at me. I tried to read her expression. Was she angry at him for what he was doing or at me for letting him do it? 
I tried to be calm, but I couldn't help myself. Bobby, get your fucking hand off my wife's breast. His smile grew even wider. Or what, Lyle? Jesus Christ, who is this guy named Lyle? Does this sound like a little girl? Hey, Lyle, this is so damn fun. I hesitated. I haven't fought with my fists for 20 years. I don't care what you think about my name. Get your hands off my wife. Diana took his hand and pushed so that he let go of her breast. Okay, Bobby, calm down. Why do you always act like an asshole around Lyle? He's my husband. He's not as rude as you. You're always trying to get him into a fight because you know you'll kick his ass. This is unfair. And Lyle, I'm not some little girl. Bobby's a little drunk. But I can handle him. I've known him almost all my life. You don't have to make a scene trying to save me. Damn, I'll probably have to save you. I couldn't believe my ears. Now I knew that several couples around us had heard this exchange, and I heard giggling. What the hell did you just say? Her eyes widened, and I wondered if she even thought about what she said. Oh, Lyle, I'm sorry, baby. I... that's not what I meant. How the hell can you say that? Bobby pushed her aside. What she meant was that if you come into my sight, I'll kick your ass and smash your face in, you damn thick-headed moron. The only reason I haven't done this before is because she keeps begging me not to hurt you. What the hell kind of guy is hiding behind his wife's skirts? I couldn't resist. Someone who can count past ten without using his fingers, you village idiot. Someone who came and took your girlfriend from you without even bothering to break a sweat. Someone who made her two children. So I'm not even sure you could do it, or that you have the equipment to do it. I saw the Makach approaching, and at the same time, I felt that people were approaching us from behind. I was about to move out of the way when my foot slipped on what was probably someone's spilled drink. I fell on my butt and hit my head on the concrete landing. Dave, Diana's brother and his friend, ran up to Bobby and grabbed him by both arms. I hit it hard and it knocked the wind out of me. For a moment I was stunned. Bobby didn't try to shake off the guys holding his hands, probably feeling he'd get more out of the exchange. As for who has the better equipment, Lyle, why don't you ask Diana sometime? She used to think my equipment was damn good, and I heard that a pencil would fill her up more than the equipment you have. Richard Carter came up behind us and said in a firm voice, Okay, Bobby, that's enough. We let you come to these parties because you're an old friend. But you've crossed the line. Get out of here. I looked up at Bobby's grinning face and scanned the other faces around me. I saw them smile or desperately try not to smile, and then I looked at the serious face of my beloved wife and realized that she was also struggling with this. She thought it was funny, and when I looked at her, she deliberately turned away from her father. Dad, no. Bobby just drank. He didn't mean anything like that. You know she and Lyle fight, but it doesn't mean anything. And in general, I promised him this dance. Even Richard Carter looked at his daughter incredulously. Are you sure this is what you want, Diana? After what Bobby said about your husband. She looked at me without a smile. Lyle is already a grown man, Dad. If he's upset about what Bobby is doing, he knows what he can do about it. Isn't that right, baby? I pulled my arms under me and rose to my feet. I just turned and walked away from my wife. Bobby laughed. I heard giggling and desperately wanted to believe that Diana wasn't among them, but I wasn't going to turn around to be sure. As I was leaving the dance floor, Richard caught up with me and spoke to me as I left. Son, I know you're angry right now, but listen to me. I know Diana loves you, whether you believe it now or not, but women, listen, sometimes a woman, even the best woman, wants to know that her man will fight for her. Where you come from, they may not do this. But down here, a woman won't respect a man who backs away from another man, trying to get closer to her. You do what you think is right. But even if Bobby beats the crap out of you, at least fighting him will show her that you care about her enough to fight for her. I kept walking. You're right, Richard. Where I come from, women don't do that. A good woman doesn't give some sniffing dog encouragement to get into a situation where her husband has to fight for her. Not if they love their husband, if they have a real marriage. Now I'm not so sure of either. He grabbed my hand, 
and I had enough respect for him not to pull back. Maybe, maybe you're right about her disrespect for you. I'm just her daddy. I can't interfere in this matter, but I can tell you that she loves you. Don't do anything stupid now. Just go somewhere, have a drink, and chill. Everything will work out on its own. Maybe. And then I really walked away from him. The driveway lit up with the lights of a car pulling into our driveway at 1245. I had a Michelob's and a half, and I was feeling pretty good. I heard the car doors open and voices. I opened the window next to the chair, although it was cool in the house. But when they parked because the driveway was sloped, even if they were whispering, it felt like they were standing next to the window, and then I would be able to hear every word. He's here. It was older brother Dave. Thank God. What a son of a bitch. He's a pathetic bastard. Cool down. I know you're sober now. After you show your ass like that, just be glad he's here and not having sex with some random bitch like most guys. Shut up. He's my fucking husband. A big baby who goes off sucking his thumb when his feelings are hurt and leaves his wife. What kind of husband is this? The kind of guy whose wife humps her ex-boyfriend right in front of him, stupid bitch. If you weren't my sister and didn't have boys, I would tell him to just leave your ass and go find someone who won't humiliate him in public. I couldn't believe my ears. Diana was always a good little church-going southern girl. Damn and damn. Those were the strongest words I've ever heard from her, even in bed. It truly was one hell of a night. The front door opened, and they entered. A moment later, a light came on in the corridor, and he entered the office. But it only reached the center of the room. I sat in the dark. Dave entered the office first. Diana closed on his heels. He looked around and saw my figure sitting in the shadows in an easy chair. He just looked at me for a moment and then said, Hi, Lyle. Hello, Dave. There was a kind of endless silence. I wasn't going to be the first one to talk to her. Lyle, she finally said. Diana, I said in the same even dispassionate tone. Are you okay? Dave asked. Okay, thanks for asking. You bastard. She blurted it out as if she had popped a plug and couldn't hold it in any longer. I love you too, bitch. She tensed and if Dave hadn't grabbed her hand, I think she would have lunged at me. Her hair was disheveled, her face was flushed, her lipstick had long since come off, her white dress was bloody and wrinkled, and there were dirty stains on it. The party must have really been hellish after I left. Clever guy, always some clever joke. You think it's funny to leave me alone, without telling anyone where you're going, to just disappear? What kind of person are you? I don't know. Probably some thick-headed coward too scared to fight a man who's fingering his wife's breasts with her permission in front of all their friends and family. She had the decency to blush, and Dave gave her a sidelong glance. You got us worried, man, Dave said. Why didn't you answer the phone calls? I didn't want to talk to anyone. He rubbed his chin and looked from Diana to me. I guess... Then I guess I'll leave you guys to talk. It was a long night. A hell of a night. I'm getting too old for this shit. Are you sure you're okay, Lyle? I'm just being polite, Dave. I'm not fine. I don't know if I ever will again. But that's not your problem. Thank you for bringing Diana home. If it were up to me, she could go home with Bobby or camp at the RV park. He looked at both of us again and then simply shook his head. Then he looked at Diana. Then I'll leave, Lyle. Let you guys straighten things out. Diane, walk me out, okay? From their voices, I realized that they were standing near his Chevrolet Tahoe. Damn him, Dave. He's such an asshole. Any other guy would have attacked Bobby, or gotten drunk, or done something human. He leaves and sulks at home, but he doesn't. I would kick Bobby's ass, and Tommy's ass, and most of the people we know. Lyle is not like that at all. He's not a fighter. You knew this when you decided to marry him. You remember. I remember it very well. You said he's not the kind of guy who comes home with oil under his fingernails, gives you six or seven kids, gets drunk every weekend, and spits on you when you gain a few pounds. You said, and I quote, He is a man who will succeed. He will take care of me and our children, be faithful to me, and give us a good life. He is a good man. 
You wanted something better and you got it, and now you're nervous and doing this dance with a weakling, which means that if Bobby didn't get anything, he probably will. I used to be proud of you, Diana, but now I'm wondering if you're just another available girl in hot pants who's going to get divorced four or five times, drag new boyfriends home every few weeks, and make mom and dad cry when they think about the mess which you have arranged in your life. Oh, Dave, grow up. I'm not stupid. I felt excited. Maybe horny, but I wasn't 17. I played with Bobby because it was nice to feel like a teenager again for one night. My husband should have grabbed me and made me behave, but I forgot who I was married to. He's mad right now, but it will pass. It was one night and one fight. I'll go out there and give him some love, and this will all go away. People don't break up because of one quarrel. Damn you, sister. You think that since I build houses, I don't know anything about your dear husband? I have clients and partners whose children go to J.U. They talk about Lila. He is young, he has hair, he is smart, and many female students think he is cute. There was a time when he would have gotten an A or even a C. And there were women professors. First, well, let's just say she pursued him so openly that the dean had to tell her to chill or they'd have to take action. So you go out there and please him or do whatever you need to do. Lose him, and he won't sit and cry into his beer for long. She returned and stood at the entrance to the office for a long time. Neither of us said a word. Then she walked across the room towards me. I raised my hand. Stop. Take a chair and sit over there by the TV. This surprised her. I could read it on her face. She expected that she would come over kneel at my feet, hug me for a moment, and then start kissing, which would lead us to the bedroom. But this was not destined to happen. She took a deep breath. I know, Lyle, I know I acted like complete crap out there today. You don't need to lecture me. Everyone else has already done it. Jesus Christ, everyone acts like you're blood relatives and I'm a stranger. But I was drunk, you know. And Bobby, too. You know that Bobby and I have a past. We remember the distant past. We met in elementary school, can you imagine? And, you should know this, he still loves me. He never could come to terms with the fact that I chose you as my husband. I know it's not good, but sometimes I feel sorry for him. So sorry. So, are you going to ease his pain by having sex with him? Anger flared in her eyes. He's in pain. A little flirting makes him feel better. Nothing else was supposed to happen until you walked in like a thug and everything went wrong. There was no need for this. He's my friend. You are my husband, the person I love. A moment later, she was sitting in a straight-back chair. It wasn't the most comfortable place in the world, which is what I wanted. I don't want to change the subject, Diana, but I'm curious about something. I left the campsite around 8. My phone didn't start ringing until 11. I know the campground is a big place and there was a lot going on, but after that little incident, it took you three hours to realize that I was nowhere to be found? You must have really felt guilty about what happened to realize that I only disappeared for three hours. I think if we hadn't had that little incident, you wouldn't have realized that I was missing until the next morning. It tells me how important I am in your life. Anger flashed in her eyes and she was about to say something, but suddenly she remembered something and stopped. Oh my God, Lyle, don't you know that? You know? All hell broke loose after that. After you left, I really forgot about you. Everyone also forgot for a while, but that doesn't mean I don't care about you. It's simple. Well, that's enough. What happened? Then, after that, Bobby and I danced a little. I know I shouldn't have done this, but I was so damn mad at you. I... I know you're not fighting, but... God, this sounds like I'm 13, but it hurt me that you didn't at least take a swing at Bobby. If he had hit you, I would have been there, loving and comforting you, and that's what I wanted. You are my husband, but you are gone. So yes, I was angry. I danced with him. And you know Bobby, he was drunk. So after a few minutes, he went to the toilet. Knowing Bobby, I figured he would either go to the lake or behind one of the cabins. I talked to a few people and didn't think about Bobby anymore for a while. After about half an hour, I began to wonder where he had gone. I wasn't worried about you because you usually leave and we don't meet until late in the evening. Then I heard a scream. 
and everyone ran to the lake. People crowded around someone lying on the ground. I tried to come closer and suddenly realized it was Bobby. It was terrible. His face was covered in blood. One eye was swollen and closed. I was told that his arm and several other fingers were broken. Dave and a few other people were talking to him, and I heard them say that someone should call the sheriff. Three biker types smashed Bobby's face, saying something about a party of old farts ruining their party. When they started arguing, all three attacked Bobby. He said that some of them would limp and suffer for a while, but there were too many of them. Then everything went wrong. We called paramedics for Bobby and the sheriff's office sent three patrol cars, and they checked the park to see if there were bikers or anyone else there. And then after a while, people started checking to make sure everyone was okay. I took note of what she told me and the obvious question came to mind. And yet it took you a total of three hours and some time after you found out that bad bikers were roaming the park to ask where your beloved husband had gone? I repeated. I really must be very high on your list of important people. She bit her lip and didn't look at me. Then it dawned on me. You weren't in the park, were you? You wanted to go with Bobby to the hospital. You had to hold his hand, didn't you? Finally, she looked at me. He was beat up like hell, Lyle. He was in pain and asked me if I would go with him. I couldn't tell. No, you couldn't. There seems to be a pattern developing here. You just can't say no to Bobby. Don't do this, Lyle. It was a worthy human act. If you weren't so mad at me, you'd know it. Of course, he was an old friend. An old friend you had sex with before I showed up. You should have been there for him in his time of need. You had sex with him then, didn't you? She lowered her eyes, shook her head, and met my gaze again. Yes, Lyle. And you knew it. Everything was serious with us then, and I was not a little girl. We made love often. It makes you feel better. And before you ask, he was good. Great. Does this make me an approachable girl? What about you? I know damn well you weren't a virgin when we got married. Should I be jealous of all the women you've been with before me? No. That was then. This is now. Well, yes. He asked me to go with him and I went. I held his hand, the one on which they didn't break their fingers. There was an emergency medical technician there with us, and people surrounded us every second while we were in the emergency room in the tent where they were patching him up. Nothing happened, Lyle, and even if we were alone, it would never have occurred to him to contact me. You have nothing to be jealous of. Did I say that I'm jealous? And you don't need to. I see it on your face every time he's around me. I guess I can't blame you. If you were always with another woman who I know you were with before us, it would eat me up. Have you ever thought about me? She lowered her eyes again and tried not to look me in the eyes. Lyle, you know that's not a fair question. There was so much going on. Bobby was injured. Everyone was calling each other. So my answer is no. When and who finally began to be interested in me? She continued to look at the floor. They treated Bobby and his brother came to take him home. I returned to camp with Kelly and Billy. When I got there, Dad came up to me and asked if I'd seen you since... This is wonderful, Diana. Your father thinks highly enough of me to remember that I disappeared before my wife did. She looked at me, and I saw tears shining in her eyes. Keep up the good work, Lyle. I screwed up and you're going to hurt me even more for what I did. That's good. I feel a lot crappier now. Sorry, my bad conscience is probably tormenting me, isn't it? It's hard for me to say because I didn't deceive you. She just looked at me and lowered her eyes to the floor again. We were both silent for a minute. Well, at least we cleared the air, dear. She looked at me with a puzzled expression. What? I stayed here because I wanted to talk to you before. I'll leave. Where are you going? You're not mad at me anymore, are you? I looked at her, dirty, disheveled, blood on her white dress, and thought that I had never seen anything more beautiful before. And I'll never see you again. I have something to do that I put off until I can talk to you. Then I'll find a place to stay, some cheap motel, and on Monday I'll arrange a permanent place to live and meet with a lawyer. A place where we can spend the night? Advocate? Lyle, 
Are you crazy? What are you talking about? Did we just have a fight? It's too bad, but I love you. People don't run away because of one fight. What happened to you, Lila? This morning we were happy. What could happen in less than 24 hours to make you want to leave me? I didn't answer her. I just pointed down the hallway leading to the children's bedrooms. Go, I said. She slowly stood up and walked into another room. I knew that she would see the suitcases, the laptop, my briefcase. She returned to the office more and more slowly, shaking her head as if she could not believe what she saw. You're crazy, Lyle. You leave me and our two sons because of one quarrel. I made one stupid mistake when I was drunk a few hours ago. I didn't have sex with anyone. I didn't betray you. You're just out of your mind. When I didn't answer, she walked towards me, and I raised my hand again to stop her. She backed away, but did not sit down. Can you tell me why? Can't you at least do this? I had a moment of epiphany. I could see that she had no idea what I was talking about. Moment of epiphany? Why are you doing this, Lyle? I know you think you're smarter than me, anyone in my family, anyone here. But why can't you help but rub our noses in the fact that we are idiots compared to you? Put it into words I can understand. And she was right. I took my intellectual superiority over Diana and her family for granted. I never realized how much of an asshole I was simply for working with my head instead of my hands and far surpassing anything Diana's family had in their education. I'm very sorry, Diana. This is true. I do not want to do this. That's just what English literature professors think and say. It's actually not that hard to explain. We, all of us, walk around never really seeing what our whole life is all about. We are blinded by all the little details of our existence, waking up, brushing our teeth, going to work, paying bills, watching what's on TV tonight, and the kids catching colds and wondering if we're getting fat or if our husbands or wives are looking at others. We never take a step back and get a picture of where our lives are. Except in rare cases. I was silent for a while, and then added, Tonight I had a moment of epiphany. You repeat this all the time, but what does it mean? And what did you see? I had to squeeze out these words. It was the hardest speech I had ever given because I knew I was killing our life together, killing my life with the two boys I loved more than life itself. But she deserves to know why I'm leaving. I saw our life, Diana. I saw who we are, who we were, and who we have become. It had nothing or very little, to do with what happened at the party. You're right. Leaving because of one quarrel, one mistake, one incident, would be madness. That's not why I'm leaving. I'm leaving because I realize that our marriage was a mistake, that I love you, but you don't love me, that I will never or probably never satisfy you sexually the way you should be satisfied, that deep down, you are a good woman. And never leave me because you will keep your promises and that we are too young to ruin each other's lives for the next 40 or 50 years. That's why I'm leaving when we finish our conversation. She shook her head again, and this time the tears actually began to flow. I knew that she was crying about a life that was ending just like me. The fact that she didn't love me the way I loved her didn't mean there wasn't any love there. But this is not enough. How can you say such things, Lyle? How can you be so cruel? Look at me, Diana. Answer me two questions, and if I'm wrong, I'll think again. There was a look of fear on her face, and I knew that she had somehow guessed what I was going to ask her. Have you ever cheated on me, baby? Have you been with another man since we got married? She was mute. The expression on her face answered that question. Thank you. That's one of the reasons why I love you. You could lie or try to tell half-truths, but you are too good a woman. You can't lie and you won't tell me the truth, which you know will break my heart. But we both know the answer to this question. You just answered. Silence is eloquent. And the second question. Are you in love with me, Diana? I love you, Lyle. How the hell can you ask me that? No matter what, you need to know that I love you. That's not what I asked, Diana. Are you in love with me? I do not understand anything. You love your father, 
your mother, our boys, your brothers and sisters. I know that you would give your life for them. But being in love is completely different. It's when you take your breath away, when you look at the man who makes your heart beat faster, who makes you horny when he kisses your neck and caresses your chest, who you dream about and want when he's not around. This is how I feel about you. I don't know if you felt the same way about me when we were married, but I know you don't feel that way now. You would be a good sister to me, but not a wife. Is that all? She stood up and walked towards me. Is this all about sex, Lyle? That's what it's really all about. You're sorry because I'm not some available girl in bed with you. I am. I love sex with you. It doesn't have to be all rockets and fireworks. It can be quiet and nice, too. I stood up and walked out into the light to meet her. When I stepped into the light, she lost her breath and staggered back. Oh, my God, she exhaled. You never called me, Diana, and you know it. You've never screamed as loudly at the peak of pleasure as you did with someone else. You just lay there and let me do my thing. Do you really think I can't tell you how tired you are of my lovemaking? She stopped backing up, reached out a trembling hand and gently touched one side of my face, gently feeling with her fingers the swollen flesh surrounding my almost closed left eye. I knew that the rest of my face was made up of various shades of yellow, red, and brown. My lips were swollen, except for one piece missing on the left side. Oh my God, they found you and beat you up too. Why didn't you go to the hospital and seek medical help? I tried to smile, and that in itself must have been scary as hell, judging by the look on Diana's face. You should look at another guy. From the expression that slowly appeared on her face, I knew that she understood what my face meant. I stood in the dark by the lake, listening to the music and imagining that I could still hear snatches of laughter from the people around Diana and Bobby. I didn't have to go back to find out she was dancing with him. I could go back and face Bobby. I'd been beaten before, back in the days when I was running around the streets of South Boston as a wild boy without a father. I was often beaten like a runt shrimp trying to stay with 16- and 17-year-olds until my mother finally wised up and moved us to a small town south of Boston, away from the gangs. I didn't mind the beating for that matter, and I probably wouldn't, because I didn't fool myself into thinking I could beat him in a fair fight. He was bigger and stronger and undoubtedly tougher than the guy who makes his living standing in class and ranting, but it was the look in her eyes when she provoked me to do something about Bobby's insults, the way she allowed him to hold her and stroke her, the way his hands roamed over her easily and familiarly. I think I always knew, but now I couldn't bring myself to ignore the truth that he had sex with her. Once upon a time, somewhere, another person was the center of my entire life, and she shared things with him that she would never share with me. How can you live your life if it is built on lies? I leaned against a tree and stared at the cloudy night sky, wondering how I could turn around a life that had gone so far back and make it all right again. How can you forgive a woman who is your whole life when she gives her body and possibly her love to another man? I wonder if they laughed at me when they were together. Did she really call me a pencil? Am I really that small, or is he that huge? I didn't think I was so small down there. At least I never received any complaints. I heard someone stumbling through the weeds and bouncing off the trees, someone staggering towards the lake. Stopping about a dozen feet away from me, facing the dark lake, he didn't even look back at me, but unzipped his zipper and released the stream. Even with my back turned, I knew who it was. I didn't intend to do anything at all. Beating people up was the most asshole way. It never solved anything. So I was pretty damn surprised when he turned to go back and found me, punching him in the face, with all the force I had while running, which added to the force of the blow. He spun and fell without saying a word, just groaned as he hit the ground. Before he could get to his hands, I kicked him as hard as I could in the stomach, lifting his whole body, and this time he grunted loudly. I tried to hit him below the belt again, but this time he turned enough to catch the kick in the thigh and grab my leg, and when I pulled it back, he threw me away from him. Having lost my balance, I fell backwards. When I propped myself up on my elbows and stared into the darkness of the night, he was already on all fours. He touched his forehead with his finger, and I saw something dark and shiny. 
I tore the skin with my glancing blow, probably the college ring on my right hand, which had two diamonds held in place by small prongs. Damn me, Lyle. I didn't think you had it in you, weakling. Sure, you had to sneak up on me, but at least you had the courage to try and hit me. But now I'm going to hurt you very, very much, boy. And I'll be right because I'll tell everyone, including Diana, how you idiot hit me. I was trying to get up when he lunged at me. I fell under his large, heavy body, trying to free myself. Rising slightly, he raised his fist. I didn't even see how it hit, but it hurt like hell. It felt like someone hit me on the head with a metal gong. My ears began to ring, and the vision in that eye went dark for a moment. Then something hit me in the nose, and there was blood everywhere, and I couldn't breathe for a moment. Before I could come to my senses, the world exploded again, and I saw nothing. I wondered if he had blinded me, but after pushing him away for a second, I realized that it was just a stream of blood in both eyes, blinding me for a moment. I could only move my head slightly, but I still didn't understand how I did it, because his next blow flew past me and he lost his balance and fell. I jumped to my feet and, as he rose to his knees, struck him with the sole of my boot and was delighted to see the blood spray and feel his nose and cartilage crunch under my heel. He fell backward, groaning, and making sounds that were not words. I tried to kick him again, but he somehow dodged the blow and buried his big fist deep into my stomach and then pushed me away. I fell backwards, gasping for air. Every time I breathed, it felt like something sharp was trying to escape from my chest. That bastard broke my ribs. He rolled back and got onto all fours. In the darkness, his broken nose and grunting reminded me of the dangerous wild boar I hunted with Richard Clark once early in my married life. There was nothing human in his eyes, and now I am scared. He didn't just want to hurt me. I think he lost his sense of reality and would have killed me if he could. I had to get up because I couldn't let him knock me down again. I knew that if he took me down this time, he would beat me to death using his superior weight and strength. I didn't know if I could do it, but when he lunged at me, I managed to swing and get out of his way. He fell back onto all fours, leaning on his left arm and extending his right, trying to maintain his balance. I didn't think, I just reacted. I don't think I've ever seen this trick at any martial arts or UFC match. I grabbed his right arm, stretched it out, and leaned on his back with my elbow and forearms, both knees and all my weight. I heard and felt something click and he screamed. He rolled back and forth trying to shake me off, but I held on like a bull terrier, tugging and tugging the damn hand over and over again. He finally rolled over onto his back, and before he could try to push me away, I fell to my knees, one on his elbow and the other on his forearm. He tried to scream, but his breath was taken away. I hit his elbow again, then again, and then I just learned all my weight on him and held him there while he squirmed like a fish trying to get off a hook. Finally, I let go and fell backwards. I was no longer afraid of him. He pressed his hand to himself and simply rolled back and forth on the grass. He was choking and crying. I probably should have felt worse about what I did to him, but that bastard stole my wife and probably ruined my marriage, which cost me two sons. So it was hard for me to feel too bad. As he groaned, I realized I could still hear the faint sounds of southern rock in the distance. There were no screams or anyone's screams to be heard. Nobody heard anything. I rolled back towards him and grabbed his injured right arm. He tried to swing at me, but I jerked my hand a couple of times, causing him to groan, and that put an end to his resistance. You're an asshole. You've already broken my arm, and don't give a damn, damn you. You won. I'm going to need help. I need to go to the hospital. In a while, Bobby. Let's do other things first. Fuck you. I'll call for help myself. After I hit him a couple of times with my already swollen elbow, he changed his mind. I grabbed his right hand and pulled it away from my body. He didn't have the strength to stop me. I took his little finger and held it in my right hand and pressed it down with my left to immobilize his hand. I'll ask you a few questions, Bobby, and you'll tell me the truth. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. I grabbed his little finger tightly and bent it back until I heard the knuckle crack and it just hung on the end of his hand. His eyes went wide 
and he would have screamed if I hadn't hit him as hard as I could in the solar plexus, knocking the air out of him. He coughed, gasping for air, and groaned. I waited until I thought he was listening to me again. Every time you lie or I don't like your answer, I'm going to break another finger, Bobby, and when you run out of fingers, I'll move on to your toes and then find other bones to work on. You understand me? Finally, he nodded and said quietly, You're on a horse, Lyle, so I'll tell you whatever you want. But the day will come when I will be on top, and when that happens, I think you'll just disappear. Your body will end up in a 20-mile swamp, and no one will ever know what happened to you. Perhaps, but right now I want to know how long you had sex with Diana. He was silent for a minute. This time or earlier? I already know that you slept with her before we met. I mean, since we got married. He smiled. I was tempted to break another finger, but I wanted to save them in case I really needed them. About four years. Four years? Well, yes. How... How did it happen? How often? A malicious smile appeared on his face, but it disappeared, and judging by his tone, I believed his words. I've been hunting for her since the day you married her. I tried everything. Went to her work, just looked at her home, looked sad, tried to make her laugh. But she never cheated on you. It drove me crazy. And then one day, four or four and a half years ago, she came up to me when I was leaving 7-Eleven. She didn't smile or flirt, but she asked if I wanted to go somewhere for coffee. We didn't do anything that day or for the next six months, but she came for me. And then one day we ended up at my house and she went crazy about me. She behaved like an approachable girl. She did everything to me that a woman can do. She acted as if she really wanted this. God, it was great. I've been trying to get sex for four years in one day and we almost succeeded. He tried to laugh, but he choked and had to tilt his head to spit out blood and what looked like a white tooth fragment. He sighed slowly and then said, I thought she would leave you. The next day I came to your house and she hit me when I tried to grab her breast. She screamed at me and swore that she would call the police and arrest me for rape. I wanted to kill her. I was so angry. She was just a liar, a lying cheater, and I left. And I didn't see her for three months. I tried to stay away from her. I have never been so angry in my life. And then one day, he spat again and lowered his head back onto the grass. She showed up at my house. Without saying a word, she just walked in and we went into the bedroom and didn't come out for 48 hours. She told me that. You took the boys to your mother in Massachusetts and were going to stay there for a week. We had sex for five days in a row. He shook his head and looked at me with an almost friendly smile, a boy's smile on that disfigured face. I thought I had her again, but as soon as you returned, she didn't want to give me any time. When I came while you were there, she was friendly, but that's about it. No touching, nothing else. He tried to move his hand, which I had immobilized, but only winced when I pressed lightly on it. And it's been like that for the last four years. Every three, four months she'll come and we'll do this until we're brain dead for a day or two, and then she'll come back to you and it'll be like, it never happened. I tried to digest what he told me. This wasn't just a one-night stand. Four years. For four fucking years she stabbed me in the back enjoying life with a guy who didn't have oil under his nails and gave her a good life and the only thing she had to do was put up with his boring sex. He screamed it again and jerk it up war, but I was able to hold him until he stopped jerking. Sorry about that. I didn't even intend to break it. I just forgot for a minute. I'll kill you slowly. I didn't want to know. It was like pulling scabs out of a painful wound, but I had to do it. I grabbed the third finger, and he almost tried to clumsily hit me before he realized that I could just keep hurting him and he wouldn't be able to stop me. So she stayed with me because of the money? Otherwise she would have left me for your great dignity? And that's all? He groaned quietly under his breath, and then surprised me with his laugh. You're a fucking idiot. You don't understand, do you? And what don't I understand? She never needed your money, asshole. I drive a backhoe and make almost as much as you, according to what she told me in bed one day. And you know that Richard and Ricky set it up so they could split all their money before they died. 
In a few years, she'll be able to buy and sell you, you asshole. You don't understand prize money at all. So why? She loves you. You damn idiot. Why, I will never know. She loves me, and that's why she sleeps with you? Jesus Christ. You don't understand anything, do you? She gets more from her sex toy than she ever got from you. She once told me that she can fall asleep while you make love to her. That's how exciting you are. She tries to be faithful to you, but sooner or later she gets so excited that even though she screams, she comes to me. And I make her scream. I used to tease her, calling her a loudmouth when we were dating. She was the wildest woman I've ever had, and you put her to sleep. He looked up at me, and for the first time in my life, I was tempted to kill a person. I probably could have killed him. I settled for snapping another finger, pressing my top hand to his throat to muffle his scream. When he stopped screaming, I let him go, grabbed the zipper on my pants and unzipped it. He tried to stop me, but I took him below the waist and squeezed him tightly. Please? He moaned. What's please? I said, squeezing him a little harder. It probably wasn't too erotic because he wasn't aroused, but it hurt. It occurred to me, lover, that I may not be able to please her the way you do, but I'm damn sure you'll never please her or any other woman again. I'll just squeeze really hard or use that pocket knife I have in my left pants pocket. You remember that guy whose wife cut off his dignity all those years ago? He became a star in adult films after they sewed him back. Well, I think I'll walk around the lake, throw it in the water, and if I'm lucky, some bass or turtle will swallow the damn thing. Yes, I would like that. Turn you into a woman. I enjoyed the look of fear on his face. For the first time, I truly broke through his shell. He believed that I would take his manhood. I don't think he was the kind of person who could live with that. Suddenly I felt sick. I thought about crippling a man because I couldn't please my cheating wife. He was just doing what a lot of guys would do. He didn't betray me. She did it. I let him go, and he tried to roll away from me to protect his private parts. I stood up and let his mangled hand fall to the ground. I turned to walk away from him when he said, You think I'm the bad guy? I'm the bastard who stole your wife and ruined your perfect marriage. I didn't look back, but it seemed to me that he was crying. You ruined everything. She was going to marry me, you know? And she was going to do it. These two boys of yours would be mine. She loved me or would have loved me. We've been together since elementary school. We were dynamite in bed. We were the same type of people. We would be happy. And then you show up with your smart mouth and good looks and talk about things she's never seen or imagined before. And you tricked her into thinking you were right for her. I looked at him again. You stupid bastard. I'm the best thing that ever happened to her. You just could never get over the fact that I took her away from you. Yes, perhaps you're right, smart guy. And look how happy it makes her and everyone else. She tried to love you and live without sex and tried to stay in a marriage that is killing her. I lost the woman I loved and should have had. I had to sneak in to be with her and see her come home with you from those parties. And you? Poor bastard. You will always be the unfortunate second to me in bed. Every time you sleep with her for the rest of your life, you will know that she dreams of me. I don't think I could stand it, but a weakling like you might even like it. You. She looked at me silently. I think he didn't want to admit that one pencil could ruin him so much, so he came up with this story about bad bikers. So that's why. He told me everything, Diana. And I believe him. People don't usually lie when you break their fingers. Oh my God. Four years. Four years. And he made you scream every time? Was his one really that much bigger than mine? Tears rolled down her face over the stains. I couldn't believe that part of me hated her, but most of me still loved her. No, baby. Maybe a little, but that's not the point. It's... it's hard to explain. It's been that way since the very first time we did it. No other man has ever had this effect on me. It was like... as if I had been electrocuted. It's not true, but it's the closest I can come to explaining it. And I think maybe if I told you this that I bored you to tears, that you didn't excite me as much as he did, maybe we could try something else, some toys or even drugs, but how could I tell you, the man I loved, 
that another man makes sex great. But with you, it was just good. I knew you would never stand it. No human ego can. So why didn't you leave me if he was so wonderful? But he wasn't. Sex with him was wonderful. I love you. I reached out and touched her cheek, wiping away a tear. I know you are not in love with me, but I believe that you love me and our marriage. But I left the rest unsaid as I walked around her and began moving luggage and a laptop into our family Saturn. I'd leave her with a big Ford Escort for her and the kids. It took me three passes, but eventually I finished and returned to the house. She didn't even seem to move. She extended her arms as if to grab me but left them hanging in the air. I don't want this, baby. I don't know how to do this, but there must be some way to fix this. Actually, no. I leaned down to kiss her and tasted her tears. Our marriage broke up. I want to see the boys and stay in their lives, but us is no longer there. Because you hate me. I looked into her sparkling eyes. No, I love you, that's why it's so hard. But you can't breathe life into a corpse. We could go to a psychologist, a sex therapist. Anything. We won't do this because deep down you don't want to be my wife anymore. I don't think you believe we can ever do this. How can you say that? Remember, I said that silence is eloquent. Sometimes silence speaks more than words. I know you don't really want to save our marriage because ever since I let you know I was leaving, you have never said two things that would show me that you still want me. These would have been the first words I would have said to you, but they never left your lips. We looked at each other, and the question was clear in her eyes. You never said, Don't go. Please don't go. When it finally dawned on her, she fell to her knees and covered her face with her hands. She cried when I left. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.